Welcome to Hot Chips 2023. Session 5 ML Training Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks. We're going to jump right into the next session on uh, ML training. Uh, I'm Dave Ditzel. Real pleasure for me to be here. I was the uh, program co-chair on the very first Hot Chips. I've been attending every year since. Uh, and I've uh, known, uh, in particular, our, our first speaker, Norm Jupy, since he was a, uh, a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, first talk is called uh, A Machine Learning Supercomputer with an Optically Reconfigurable Interconnect and Embedding Support by Norm Jupy and Andy Swing. Uh, uh, Norm is a Google Vice President, Engineering Fellow there. Uh, he got his PhD here at Stanford in 1984 before joining Google. He was an HP Senior Fellow here. Uh, he's been the uh, Principal Architect and uh, Lead Designer on many of the TPUs at, uh, at uh, Google. Um, uh, he's been uh, designing CPUs for many years, starting with the Stanford MIPS processor here. He's got over 125 U.S. patents, uh, 125 technical papers, uh, receiver of the uh, Harry Good Award and the ACM IEEE Eckert Mockley Award, uh, and a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, with him today will be co-presenting uh, Andy Swing, who's got a background in hardware, software, and system design. He's been working for Google since 2006, so a lot of experience on their uh, their. TPUs, uh, working on DRAM, SSDs, uh, and involved with the TPU program since it got started here. So uh, we, uh, we will also be using the Slack channel, so just pay attention there and post your questions uh, there, particularly if you're off-site. Thanks very much for those speakers. So let me introduce uh, Norm and Andy. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So. Uh, you can see we've got a very long title here. That's because uh, we have a lot of information crammed into this presentation. We hope you'll enjoy. Uh, this is what uh, we call TPU V4. And uh, somewhat confusingly, the V4i came out before the V4. V4i was for inference, and there's a paper about that in the ACM and IEEE. Okay. So, I have a bit of a volume ringing here. Uh, <laughs> maybe the gain can be turned down. Okay, so we have a lot of breakthrough innovations in our fourth generation system. We've got optical circuit switching. Uh, we have a third generation embedding scope processor uh, for dealing with sparse operations and particularly embeddings. And uh, We've had this in previous chips, but we've just labeled that area of the dive floor plan MISC logic. Uh, we've got uh, industry-leading compute power efficiency, and I'll explain some reasons behind that. Uh, uh, 4,096 chips, all sharing 256 terabytes of HBM memory. Uh, you remember distributed shared memory was a big thing. There were a lot of research programs in the early 90s, but I believe this is the, the largest shared memory machine ever. And we've had it in production in hyperscale since 2020. So uh, as has been remarked in the press, uh, Google is generous enough to allow us to write technical papers about our products uh, when the next generation product is already serving in uh, our data centers. I obviously won't confirm or deny that, but we're presenting a paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the V4 is a seven nanometer chip. It's optimized for training where the V4i was optimized for inference. And uh, as such, uh, this one contains two cores of uh, TPU V4i. So you can imagine two cores on a die has lower yield but higher performance. And so th this makes it more suitable for training than for inference. We have 4x the HBM capacity of TPU V4i. Uh, you need a lot of capacity for 
holding activations, uh, gradients, uh, optimization parameters, things like that. And uh, it has a 3D versus 2D torus. So this is the first time we've had a 3D tori in our machines. It's uh, 275 peak flops, but we've designed the machine to get a very high sustain number. Uh, for some of the reasons that Bill talked about, there's a lot of overheads and you want to minimize those overheads. And one of those is um, wasting flops. And the typical power running the applications that we'll be talking about later, uh, not to say this is the power virus number, is 200 watts. So what we typically do is we don't quote TDP because for a lot of our applications, they're real time. We have service level uh, requirements of five milliseconds, for example. We've written about this in our papers. So we don't want the chip to decide to throttle in the middle of some kind of uh, customer query. So that, that means it's uh, cheaper for us in terms of not impacting the customer experience to over provision the power. And so TDP is not um, a useful measure in that environment because we pay a large insurance policy in TDP to make sure that's never a limit. Okay, here's the chip architecture. Uh, you can see, uh, and I I've heard the people remotely can't see the pointer, but I'll do it for the benefit of uh, you all. We have two tensor cores at the top. Uh, they're identical, but each one has four matrix multiplier units that are 128 by 128. Uh, they talk to a common memory and can share data that way, uh, which can be quite useful. And uh, through an on-chip interconnect, they get to HBM channels uh, and HBM stacks. They're, they also connect to sparse cores here, and I'll be talking more about the sparse core later. This ICI router uh, connects to the six links of the 3D torus. Actually, I, I forgot there's an animation, so I can go through them like this. Uh, and then finally, we have a PCIe connection to the host. So. We don't really need a very high speed connection to the host because the accelerator is so much faster than the host. It, if we try to do things on the host, it generally slows things down. Okay, this is an eye chart. I know you won't probably be able to read it from the front row level in the back, but one thing I wanted to point out here is the power numbers. If you can look at the TPU V3 column on the right and the V4 in the middle here, and then look down to the idle min-max uh, mean power, uh, you can see that even though we've more than doubled the flops, or the peak flops, and doubled the performance, we've actually reduced the power compared to the previous generation. So this is a good direction to be on. Okay, I promised to talk about the sparse core. It's an accelerator, different kind of accelerator in the TPU. And we have several of them uh, instantiated. So because the sparse core deals with sparse data and in the embeddings can be very short, like uh, 32 bytes or less, we have to uh, be able to have many threads to fetch them, uh, especially since they can be anywhere in the 4096 chip system. So we have a dispatch unit, uh, a sorting sparse reduction unit, uh, which in, uh, uh, and then forking to a bunch of arithmetic units with small memories and basically a uh, sparse matrix uh, times vector units. Uh, so the shared memory within the 4096 chip system is non-coherent. 
So that makes it a lot easier or, or feasible in, in actuality. And we can support millions of outstanding references all at the same time between the 4096 chips and each other's HBM. So um, it's a huge level of parallelism. What does sparse core give us in terms of performance? Well, we've got a CPU here as the baseline. That's what they were uh, researchers and production people at Google were using before we developed TPUs. The, the V3 with its sparse core, 128 TPUs has almost 10 times the performance of uh, 576 CPUs. So it's, it's more than or around four times the number of CPUs, but um, one-tenth the performance. And in the V4, we've improved it considerably. We've gotten uh, another 3x improvement in performance. Now, other companies have proposed putting embeddings on a, a CPU uh, that's closely connected to uh, the accelerator. We, we've looked at that, and it's not as effective. It's only like 4.3 even on TPU v4. And then uh, finally, the another old way of doing it was to keep the embeddings on embedding servers spread around the data center. That's actually a little bit better, but it's still a factor of five worse than the current sparse core. So for the board, uh, we put four TPUs per board. Uh, you can see here, uh, they're all water-cooled and uh, the intake uh, goes here, there's a valve, and then it, there's parallel paths for the water to flow, and then it, it exits here. And so you can think of the valve like a fan speed controller. In your PC, you wouldn't run the fan at maximum speed all the time. You'd want to run it slower if there was uh, less heat load, faster if there's more. So that's basically what the valve does. You can also see there's PCI Gen 3 by 16 connectors here and on the back side, which is harder to see, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, there's 16 OSFP connectors, uh, which is octal sm small form factor pluggables. The pluggables part is really important because some of them uh, go to electrical cables, some go to optical cables, and it, it varies depending on where the board is in the system. Finally, uh, here's putting them together in a rack. Uh, we have power supplies at the top, and then we alternate uh, CPU boards and uh, with the uh, TPU boards. The nice thing about this is that within a rack, the distances are short enough that we can run the interconnects between chips with electrical cables, which are much cheaper than optical cables. However, for going off chip, we need uh, well, basically for inner rack connections, we need optical cables. And then here's what the basic system building, book, building block looks like. Uh, we've got eight racks connected to a CDU. A CDU is this thing on the right. It's a pretty amazing <laughs> piece of kit. It uh, uh, basically takes in the data center water and processes it, it, cleans it up, and runs a different cooling loop uh, for these. And there's a very small temperature drop, only a few degrees uh, between the two, so it's very efficient. And then you can see the sizes of the hoses here. Uh, the, the water flow rates are greater than those of uh, a hook and ladder fire truck. So <laughs> it's pretty impressive when you, when you see them going. So we deploy these in groups of eight and uh, until we have 64 Google racks to make up a system. Uh, that one system is one exaflop 
and each group of racks, eight racks, gets its own CDU here on the right. We've deployed dozens of systems and up to eight uh, systems per cluster. And uh, at this point, I'm going to switch over to Andy, who's going to talk about the OCS and the performance. Thank you, Norm. You guys can hear me okay? All right. Uh, cool. So let's uh, let's take a look at some of the different building blocks uh, in this system here. Um, so each one of those racks has 64 chips in it. That's arranged in a four by four by four cube. Uh, and as Norm mentioned, all the connections between the chips within that cube are made with copper cables. They're uh, less expensive. Uh, but then the faces of the cube, so any link that comes out of that cube or comes out of that rack uh, is optical. And we send those links over to a set of 48 OCS devices. And that uh, essentially allows us to take these cubes and logically snap them together uh, through optical switching uh, and build a larger uh, flexible system. So you might be wondering what, what is an OCS? Maybe you haven't uh, uh, seen this before, right? Uh, uh, this thing is a, a, a true marvel of engineering, really. Uh, the, the whole idea is that it has uh, you know, 128 optical ports coming in, 128 optical ports coming out, and through the magic of uh, MEMS mirrors and a bunch of software and really, really uh, uh, you know, advanced engineering, you can uh, connect any of those input ports to any of those output ports completely non-blocking. Uh, so the light bounces around a few times in there, pops out the other side, only slightly attenuated. Uh, there's uh, some injectors in there and cameras that keeps these mirrors all perfectly lined up uh, you know, while the thing is running. Uh, and you can reconfigure this uh, you know, on the fly. It takes milliseconds to, to change uh, a route uh, through it. Uh, and we've had these around for, for quite some time, uh, all, all developed internally at Google. Uh, okay, so I've got my racks, uh, my cubes there, I've got my OCSs, but I have to connect them together. Uh, and this means we need a lot of fiber. Uh, I'm talking tons of fiber. Uh, in fact, each one of these 64 rack super pods has enough fiber in it to encircle the state of Rhode Island. Uh, I had to check that math three times. I, I didn't believe it. It's, it's so much fiber. <laughs> um, there's over 16,000 individual connectors that have to be uh, you know, plugged in when these things are commissioned. Uh, so you might imagine we have a huge focus on serviceability, uh, repairability, right? Uh, good colors, labels, uh, software, uh, checkers, all these things uh, to make sure that these links are in good working order and get installed properly the first time. So if we zoom out a little, uh, I have my entire physical system here, my uh, you know, eight sets of eight racks on the left here, uh, all those fiber strands in the middle, and those end up connecting to a set of six uh, OCS racks. Uh, 48 total OCS. Um, and so the colors you saw in the picture there, you know, actually mean something. Uh, you, know, you have the different dimensions that are going to connect through the different OCSs. And one of the key points here is that every single cube, every rack, has to connect to every OCS, right? Every face has to be able to snap to every other face in the X dimension, the Y dimension, the Z dimension. Uh, it's a lot of fiber. That's my point. <laughs> If I look at this in a, a logical sense, uh, you know, forget all, all the, the hardware and how it's physically laid out, uh, I essentially have a pool of building blocks, a uh, pool of 64 cubes, um, and each cube in that pool can be dynamically uh, connected to, to each other, right? So if I have a particular job uh, that comes along and says, hey, uh, I would really like an 8x8x4 eight by eight by topology. Uh, the software stack goes, finds four available cubes anywhere in that pool, tells the OCSs to make all those cross connects, uh, and hands the job uh, its own custom private uh, 3D torus uh, of, uh, of cubes. And uh, you can do the same with pretty much any logical shape, right? Any integer multiple in any dimension. Uh, this has some really nice advantages for availability. So if I have a broken link or a bad machine, it takes out you know, only a small fraction uh, of my overall capacity. Uh, and I just you know, leave that one by the wayside and, and use the rest. This is really important, like I said, for availability. Um, the chart on the left here shows you, you know, if we built these super pods with all static links, right? There was no OCS, no, no dynamic connections. Um, even if you had really, really good host availability, you know, per machine availability, 
you can't really practically use very large uh, slices or collections of chips. Uh, the availability just falls off. And then if you have something that's a little bit more practical, you know, two nines or, or two and a half nines, uh, e you know, e even then, like, you just can't use it, right? It's not practical, it's not worth it. But when you add the OCS and the dynamic uh, element here, that's the chart on the right, you see, uh, we get way better uh, availability or, or throughput, right? Um, our measure for, for getting actual work done, uh, you know, even if your host availability is not, uh, not that great. Uh, so this is the whole sort of secret behind SuperPods. There's some other things they bring for us as well. So um, uh, you could have alternate topologies, uh, such as a twisted tori. Uh, this gives you better bisection bandwidth, uh, you know, tailored to certain types of model parallelism, depending on your model. Uh, you can choose to use this or not. Um, uh, the thing that's really neat about this is it required no new hardware, right? It's all the same hardware, same OCS, the same optics, all that. You just had to tell the software to connect these links uh, in a little different way. Uh, and the performance gains for this are, are pretty good. So uh, here's an example showing uh, you know, an all-to-all -all, uh, communication pattern. Uh, and you can see the, the twisted tori gets you a you know, pretty significant boost, right? So for models that care about that sort of thing, uh, it, it's a great win. Uh, and this actually was developed pretty late in the program. You know, we kind of figured out, oh, hey, this is kind of a neat idea, uh, and we're able to implement it. If I take a bigger step back uh, and look at kind of the overall landscape, um, there have been a lot of changes in ML workloads uh, over the past six years, heck, even over the past one year, right? And so a big uh, you know, challenge we face is the hardware's gotta be relevant, not just for its whole you know, lifetime, but you know, for the couple of years ahead when we started building it and designing it and, and all that, right? You're trying to predict the future. And so we feel that having a system that's very flexible uh, uh, will help uh, keep it performant over its whole lifetime. Uh, and just to drive this point home, uh, I've got three generations of TPUs, a bunch of different uh, you know, types of models, and you can just see how the uh, you know, mix, workload mix has changed over the years, including you know, new models like BERTs and, and LLMs that we didn't even you know, know about uh, just a few years ago, right? Um, <laughs> The other thing we shoot for or shot for with this design was uh, to have a highly scalable and balanced uh, system. So, you know, ideally you would get nice uh, linear scaling as uh, you, you scaled up to more and more chips all connected together. Um, and so that's really why we chose uh, this uh, ICI network uh, to, to kind of gather all of our, uh, you know, shared uh, memory that Norm was talking about. Uh, and we do actually get linear speed ups for most models, uh, except for those pesky DLRMs. But uh, uh, when we uh, you know, measured all this, we were, we were really quite pleased with the overall performance of the system. Another thing that's very important, uh, and this was touched on in uh, Jeff and Amin's keynote yesterday, is uh, perf per watt, right? So uh, the amount of work you can get done for how much power you have to burn. Uh, and uh, the TPU V4 uh, provides some really significant gains here over the previous uh, generation. I think Norm alluded to this a little bit. Um, we have a whole bunch of uh, different models here. You know, the, the gains vary a little bit depending on the type of model, but um, we end up with a, a geo mean of about 2.7x uh, improvement over the previous generation. It's very important to us, right? We have to uh, buy and pay for all of our power. We want to be good stewards, all that. Um, Another example to point out here is the CMEM that Norm mentioned, uh, that shared memory between the tensor cores. Uh, adding that feature gave us a, a boost in power, uh, you know, perf per watt uh, as well. Uh, and so this comes from you know all sorts of architectural and process uh, advantages and all those sorts of things, right? So we, we put a lot of effort into this. Uh, and of course, we have to compare ourselves with, with others, right? So here's uh, a comparison of, of a few models between A100s uh, and TPU V4. Uh, we do pretty well on the uh, perf uh, uh, chart here. Uh, and we also do quite well on the uh, you know, power uh, measurement as well. And so you can see for BERT models, we get almost a, a 2x better uh, you know, power uh, number there. And for ResNet, it's 30% you know, 30, 30 better, uh, quite good. Okay, uh, the last thing I want to show you here, um, 
you know, I've talked a lot about the scale for 64 racks, 4,000 chips, but we can actually scale beyond that. Uh, so this is an example of a uh, training Palm, uh, which is a very, very large uh, model, 500 billion parameters. Uh, we actually train this on over 6,000 TPUs, which is more than 4,000, so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it takes 56 days to train, right? Big model, lots of compute. Um, and the way that we're able to do this is we actually utilize the data center networking that exists between these super pods. Uh, so Norm mentioned we have you know up to eight of those in a cluster. Uh, that's a big network domain. Uh, and so you can actually run, uh, run these jobs with multiple super pods coordinating with each other. Uh, in the uh, drawing here, the uh, gray or blue squares are uh, TPUs, cubes that are assigned to other jobs. Uh, you'll see in a moment some red squares that are just unassigned for various reasons. And the green ones are, of course, the ones running the job uh, uh, that we're talking about here. So the final thing I will show you, and hopefully it will play, is uh, an animation. Yes, it works. Okay. Um, and so this is uh, a sped up version over the 56 days here. And you can see those green, uh, you know, job cubes kind of bouncing around between different super pods. Uh, and the reason I really like this is it highlights all of the software uh, uh, scheduling and, and uh, you know, repairs and maintenance and monitoring and the whole stack to get up to your, your ML model. Uh, a lot of work goes into that to make something like this you know, possible. Uh, just the fact that the workload is able to bounce around and, and you know, keep working and you know, route around failures and all, all those sorts of things. That's kind of a, a big part of the Google magic is that giant software stack. Uh, with that, thank you. And uh, I think we'll take some questions. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, why don't we start uh, on the uh, question from the Slack channel, and anybody else wants to answer a question in the audience, we'll up to the, the, one of the uh, microphones on either side. So, Lisa, you got a Slack question for us? I do. Andreas Prodromo from um, NVIDIA put in a bunch of questions. I, I picked a couple out. He asks, what applications do you run to measure typical power? I mean, <laughs> typical power. What is typical? Well, you just the graph them, and there was a you know normal distribution, and typical was in <laughs> the middle. I, I don't know which ones precisely. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, LLMs tend to be the the heaviest, and uh, other things that have, for example, maybe more sparsity or things like that. Uh, basically, recurrent networks have a feedback loop, which makes them probably on the lowest side. Okay, uh, let's take a question from the audience here on what be the left side of the auditorium. Uh, just introduce you again, say your name, affiliation, and ask your question. Uh, Jay Lee from AMD. Uh, I have a question on CXL com uh, Compute Express Link. Is there any plan to support CXL in the future TPU? <laughs> We, we can't talk about future plans, sorry, because we can only talk about the system <laughs> that we had running a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's switch to the other side of the auditorium for a question. Yeah, uh, Todd B. I'm Nifidus. What, what's the advantage of a twisted torus over a regular torus? Uh, oh, it basically increases the bisection bandwidth when you have uh, non-cube shaped uh, slices. So if you have a rectangular uh, rectangular prism, then uh, you can get between a third and 66% more bisection bandwidth. Okay, back over to the left side. Hi, I'm John Mine, a Mine Executive Group. This is for Andy. Uh, I'm Jacinda's dad. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Tell us more about the optical interconnect. Is it multi-mode or single mode? What speeds? Are they AOCs or modules? Or how do you do that? Uh, I don't think we've talked about too many of those details. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, we have because of the, the paper that oh, we're yes. seeing. Yeah, yeah. Um, go for it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the OCS uh, re requires single mode. Yeah. The OCS requires single mode. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, over to the left side, Natalia. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Natalia from Cerebrus, Past HP Labs. Good to see you now. Um, I have a question about sparse cores. Actually, two part questions. One, is there any reason why you use those sparse cores for embeddings in the, uh, like in the recommender models only? And if there's any way to use them for sparse weights in transformers, it's still matrix vector multiplication. 
And the second part of the question, you showed that uh, it advantages to deal with embeddings when they are on the chip. Uh, I saw that your HBM is 32 uh, gigabytes per core in production, those DRAM models recommender can be really huge. So how do you deal with those very, very large embedding models? Okay, so I'll, I'll handle the sparse core. Did you get the second? Not quite, no. Okay, well, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, okay, so the, the sparse core, we, we've highlighted the original inspiration for the sparse core, but as you can imagine, having extra threads of control running in the background can be useful for other things like managing reductions or doing just sparse computation in general. Uh, the reason why the sparse cores are important is because the main tensor core is optimized for dense computation, very, very large dense computations. And so not all ML computations are very large dense computations. So, now, and, and if there is any reason why you cannot use or can you use those not only for embeddings in recommender models? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, we do, do use them for other things. Okay. It's just it's easier to explain for embeddings. Thank you. Let's try a Slack channel question next. Okay, this is from Anand Dyer from Intel. Is the topological flexibility that you gain with OCS at the superpod level also valuable at a 4x4x4 four by four by four cube rack level? Um, do you have to go to optics to realize that? Can you do anything in your, in your architecture to achieve it? Yeah, so the, the cube is hardwired because it's very inexpensive, right? So it's a good kind of unit size uh, where, you know, uh, if the failure domain is small enough that it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, if you were to put every single link from every chip through an OCS and optics and everything else, it would become, you know, cost prohibitive, right? Uh, so we, that, that point was chosen very carefully, yeah. Okay, let's go to the left side of the auditorium. Uh, yeah, on the uh, OCS, uh, do you just do the configuration at runtime of a job, or is it switching during jobs? And um, do you see a benefit as you go forward to making it faster and faster to switch? Yeah, uh, uh, right now it, it just sets up the job for you, right? Uh, but it's interesting to think about other applications like that. Yeah, um, you know, would it make sense to reconfigure uh, in the middle of a job between phases or something like that, right? I mean, that's all possible. Right? Well, you're not doing that at the moment then? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question though, especially when jobs take can take up to 56 days to run yes. even on that much hardware. <laughs> And we certainly rely on that for availability reasons, right? Uh, if you hit a, 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 a you know, failure or something like that, you pause, you reconfigure, you start again, right? For the right side, I'm Michael Lowry and asked a quick question about liquid cooling. Mm -hmm. um, for extreme environments, does it have to be distilled water? Could we put in antifreeze? Could we put in other kinds of coolants? This kind of question about viscosity and other aspects. So yeah, I mean, there's a specific water chemistry that's involved there, right? Uh, it's nothing too exotic, but... Uh, but could it be expanded? Uh, what do you mean could be expanded? Could, could you put it in, for example, antifreeze deployed in Antarctica? I suppose you could, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to get the power there, but... Uh. <laughs> okay, well, well, lots of questions on the audience. <laughs> Hi, Mark Griswold, Broadcom. Uh, so given that the Taurus has a low uh, global bandwidth, I imagine that for all reduces you have to be uh, doing the reduction each time you propagate uh, through to the next chip. Uh, which means you know you also need to be truncating those partial sums before you send it back out in order to have again a, a limited amount of bandwidth through the network. Uh, so, how does that large number of truncations that you have to do in the process of the sum affect the uh, convergence time and quality of results? The, the FP32 additions that we do for global reductions are the same as the ones we do in the MXUs for local reductions. Uh, what about, do you do all reduces with uh, FP8 or FP16? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to comment, but I, I can't imagine <laughs> doing them with FP8. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's uh, thank the speakers very much for a great talk.
Again, any further questions, ask in the Slack channel. The officers will take a look and try and continue to answer questions in the Slack channel. Now, our second uh, talk today uh, is called Inside the Cerebrus Wafer Scale Cluster, be presented by uh, Sean Lee. Shaw is a co-founder and chief hardware architect at uh, Cerebrus Systems. Uh, prior to founding, uh, founding Cerebrus, uh, he was uh, chief architect uh, at C-Micro and then chief architect for data center and server solutions uh, at AMD. Uh, he's been designing uh, high-performance CPUs for a number of years. He got his uh, a BS in a Master of Engineering uh, from, uh, from MIT. So, Sean, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dave. Hi, everyone. As Dave said, I am the co-founder and chief hardware architect at Cerebrus. And when we started Cerebrus, we had a vision to drastically change the landscape of compute for AI. And today I'm going to talk about how we're doing that with the wafer scale cluster. If you don't know about Cerebrus, uh, we build full AI accelerator solutions from the chip to the system to the software and the ML. We started in 2016 and now we have over 350 engineers all across the world. And, and we have customers across the spectrum from large enterprise to HPC and government. It's been a really exciting last few years for us at Cerebrus, but really for the whole ML industry. And the reason for that is the exponential growth of generative AI. We've all seen this graph multiple times today, even, right? Um, this has been, this unprecedented demand has been really enabled by hardware over the last few years. Over that time, from the BERT model to GPT-4 today, We've seen the demand grow for training ML models grow by 40,000 times more compute in just five years. Let me say that again, that's 40,000 times more compute in just five years. So if you look at the next five years and what that might look like, it's both very exciting and it's a little bit daunting at the same time. The exciting part is that we, as a hardware industry, we've been hard at work on many innovations on the process front and on the architecture front. On the process front, over the last five years, we've gone from 16 nanometers now down to where five and four nanometer parts are commonplace. There's been a steady increasing trend of transistor density over that time. Moore's law is not dead. On the architecture front, we've been going to lower precision numerics, Bill, did a great job describing various different techniques that are being used, as well as <clears throat> for specialized data paths like systolic arrays or tensor cores. And as a result, we're also seeing a steady increasing uh, trend of architecture performance per transistor. And as an architect, this is actually really refreshing. It's in fact slightly outpacing Moore's law. Architecture matters. Now that's really exciting. In the last five years, we as a hardware industry delivered five times performance from process and 14 times performance from architecture. Now the daunting part. The ML demanded 40,000 times more compute. So how do we bridge that gap? Well, it all came from cluster scale out. If you look at the performance of training ML models in the last few years, it was completely dominated by cluster scale -up. Well, you might think that's great, right? We're done. Well, unfortunately not. And the reason is that existing scale out techniques on GPU clusters have limitations. And that's because running these really massive models requires massive memory, compute, and massive communication. And trying to solve this on a giant cluster of hundreds or thousands of GPUs makes all three of these into an interdependent, intertwined distributed problem. And as a result, running a single problem requires inefficient, fine-grained partitioning and coordination of all of that memory, compute, and communication. And this complexity, it only grows as the cluster size grows. So at Cerebrus, we're taking a different approach. We believe that with a holistically different approach, we can achieve a more balanced scaling across all three dimensions. On the process side, with wafer scale integration, we can achieve an order of magnitude or more beyond what Moore's law can deliver. 
amplifying Moore's Law. We have built the wafer scale engine, the largest chip in the world. It's got 46,000 square millimeters of silicon, 2.6 trillion transistors, and 850,000 cores. On the architecture front, by using unstructured sparsity acceleration, we can also achieve another order of magnitude. And this is enabled by the full memory bandwidth for vector scalar operations and for fine-grained data flow scheduling in the hardware. Now, I've actually talked at length about both of these in the past. And so today's talk, I'm going to focus on the scale-out dimension. We believe that by rethinking the entire cluster architecture, we can architect a cluster that is inherently scalable to train the largest models. And we can overcome all of the limitations of traditional scaling. We call this architecture the wafer scale cluster architecture. Okay. <clears throat> now, before I dive into some more details here, let's look at why it's so hard to scale today. Traditional scaling, the easiest form is data parallel. It's really simple. You take a model, you replicate it across the devices. And because it's simple, it actually scales really, really well. But it doesn't work for large models that don't fit within a device. And so it's possible to split that model across multiple devices. And you can do that in a pipeline fashion called pipeline model parallel. Now this works, but unfortunately, it has high communication overhead between the devices and it has a quadratic increase in activation memory to keep the pipeline full. So there's another form of model parallelism where you split the layers across multiple devices. Again, this works, but more communication overhead and partitioning complexity. So for all of these reasons, scaling out on traditional GPU clusters is quite complicated. There's no single solution. It requires a hybrid approach of all three forms of parallelism. And this is what that complexity looks like on modern large language models. This graph shows large language models trained in the last few years and the types of parallelism that were used. And as you can see, as the models grow in size, there's more and more forms of parallelism that are needed. But it's also more complicated than that. For example, tensor model parallel is restricted to 8x. And the reason for that is you have more bandwidth within a server of GPUs that today have 8 GPUs. So as a result, as the models get larger, the clusters get larger, pipeline model parallelism actually dominates most of the scaling. So as you can see, what you end up getting is a solution that's actually a pretty bespoke distributed system that's quite complicated and can often lead to poor scaling. Now when you step back, the reason for this is because all of these forms of parallelism share one thing in common. The memory is tied to the compute. That's the fundamental problem. So at Cerebris, we're thinking about architecting the entire cluster as the ML accelerator. And when you do that, you can decouple the memory from the compute. We can architect cluster-level memory and cluster-level compute, moving the model parameters out of the compute into an external store and using an execution model called weight streaming where we stream those model weights to the compute when they're needed. This can completely untangle the complexity of the memory and the compute dependency. And as a result, you can scale the model size completely independent of the training speed. We start with the wafer scale engine. This is the largest chip in the world with 850,000 cores. And this is key because it's large enough to run models, even the largest models, on a single chip without partitioning. We build a system around that called the CS2. And then to that system, we add external memory that we call memory X. This is where we're storing all of the model parameters or the model weights. Up to 120 trillion parameters can be stored in this external unit, and it can be streamed and trained on a single CS2. Now we scale out. 
We add to that an interconnect that is designed specifically for data parallel only training. And as a result, we can get near linear performance scaling all the way to 192 CS2s. This is the way that works. We have weights in the external memory, in memory X. These weights are streamed to the CS2 to perform the computation one layer at a time. And the key here is that these weights, they're never actually stored on the wafer, not even temporarily. They stream through, they perform the computation, and that's it. Only activations are on the wafer. On the backward pass, gradients are then streamed out of the CS2 back to the memory X, where we have local compute to perform operations like the weight update and optimizer. So what this is, is you can think of it as like a cluster level memory and compute hierarchy that's designed specifically for massive models. And then to scale this out, we have a Formex interconnect that performs the data parallel scaling to the CS2s, which broadcasts or replicates the weights towards the CS2s and then reduces the gradients on the way back. Now, because this is data parallel only scaling, this is the simplest, easiest way of scaling, it means you can get multi-system scaling with exactly the same execution model as a single system. It's the same architecture, the same execution flow, the same software. The compute scaling is completely independent from the model capacity. So next, let's dive into some of the details of the cluster components. The first is memory X. Each of these memory X units is constructed out of 12 memory X nodes so that we can drive up the performance and the throughput to match the CS2. This is where we're mapping the model weights into the hardware. The state, which are the model weights, they're stored in DRAM and in flash, very cost effective, very high performance. In each node, we have up to one terabyte of DRAM and 500 terabytes of flash. What this means is in a, in a cluster, it could be tens to hundreds of terabytes of DRAM and petabytes of flash, all to store the model weights. Next to the compute, I mean next to the state, we have compute. This is in the form of multi-core CPUs that perform the operations like the optimizers and the weight updates. Its general purpose is flexible so that we can support the full range of common ML operations. And then lastly, the memory X unit is connected into the cluster over 100 gigabit ethernet. And here each node has two interfaces. One that's dedicated to traffic towards the CS2, and then the other that's dedicated towards traffic going to other memory X nodes. And the key here is that we treat all of the nodes together as an aggregated dis distributed capacity so that we can get all of the capacity but also drive up the performance. We do this by sharding the weight tensors across the nodes. But when you shard tensors in a distributed fashion, special handling has to be taken for non-element-wise tensor operations. And one of the key operations here is the transpose operation because weights are transposed on every iteration of the backward pass for every layer. So to handle this, we shard the weights in a checkerboard sharding pattern such that we can get a zero communication transpose just by streaming the weights in different orders. In the four pass, every row can be streamed in parallel across all of the memory X nodes towards the CS2s. And in the backward pass, all of the columns can be streamed in parallel across all the nodes to the CS2. Just by streaming the weights in a different order and performing the same computation, we can perform the transpose operation without any memory X to memory X communication. In addition to this, we also support a full range of collective communication operations that are more rare, but they're used in some ML operations like gradient clipping. All of this capability is performed in a highly tuned runtime. 
which has two main functions. It transfers the data and it performs a computation. We actually have three independent runtimes in every memory X node. There's a wait runtime, which is responsible for the primary wait streaming function. It's streaming the weights and the gradients to and from the CS2, and it's performing the compute on those weights, the optimizer functions, the weight updates. In addition, we have an activation runtime, which is responsible for streaming all of the activation tensors to and from the CS2. This is for things like the training data set, as well as activation, eviction, and refills. And then lastly, we have a command runtime, which is responsible for streaming all the control information towards the CS2s. So this includes instructions for synchronization, for coordination of the kernels that are running on the CS2, as well as the memory X units. So next, let's talk about how we scale this out. This SwarmX fabric is responsible for two primary functions. The first is the actual physical connectivity, and the second is performing the broadcast and reduce function. On the connectivity front, the physical interconnect between all of the cluster components is high-speed 100 gigabit Ethernet. It's standard-based, it's cost-effective, it's high-performance. And on top of it, we're running Rocky RDMA for low overhead and ultra-low latency. For broadcast reduce, we're performing that actual function on CPUs because it's general purpose and high performance so that we can enable the ultra-efficient data parallel only training. So if you look at a broadcast reduce node, every broadcast reduce unit is actually made up of 12 nodes so that we can have the high performance and the high throughput to match the CS2. This is where we're mapping the data parallel training directly into the hardware. There's local buffers for the streaming packets and there's compute in the form of multi-core CPUs to perform the actual broadcast and the reduction operation. And then every broadcast reduce node has six 100 gigabit ethernet Rocky RDMA links. We use five of them to perform a four to one reduction uh, or a one to four broadcast. And this allows for one more link that's redundant. So that means that every broadcast reduce node has 600 gigabits of broadcast reduce bandwidth and at the cluster scale, say for a 64 node cluster, that's over 150 terabits per second of broadcast reduce bandwidth. Within the broadcast reduce node, we have high performance data paths to perform the actual function. For the broadcast, we use a zero copy method with lightweight control processing and then for the reduce, we support a range of flexible reduction operations, including the most common summation, but also min and max operations. And this is really important because it supports all the ML use cases. Obviously, you need summation to support the data parallel gradient accumulation, but there are other operations, such as contrastive loss or tensor summaries that require other types of reductions as well. So I've described the memory X unit and the form X and broadcast units. So let's, next, let's talk about how these are all connected together. And here, we use a scalable and flexible two-layer spine leaf network topology. At the leaf layer, we have a leaf switches, we have a set of leaf switches that connect the memory X globally towards the broadcast reduce and the CS2s. It also serves as the local interconnect for the local collective communication patterns between the weight shards. And then at the spine level, we have a set of spine switches that are all to all connected to the memory X leaf switches, as well as all to all connected to the CS2s. This is also where we directly connect the broadcast reduce nodes so that they can process data while in transit from the memory X to the CS2s. This all-to-all -all connectivity is really important because it provides the high aggregate bandwidth and flexibility. We provide 4.8 terabits per second of 
spine switching bandwidth per CS2. And when you scale that up to a large cluster of, say, 64 CS2s, that's over 300 terabits of interconnect bandwidth. Now, the flexibility from the all-to-all -all connectivity is really important because it allows us to do efficient resource provisioning and management. And here we need to manage resources like the memory X capacity, which determines the size of the model, as well as the number of memory X units, which determines how many jobs we're actually running. The cluster manages all of this while supporting subcluster partitioning. So for example, you can subpartition a 16 node cluster into an eight node, a four node, a two node, and two one nodes, depending on the workload needs. During the partitioning, the cluster is allocating the memory X memory so that large models get more capacity on the memory X, and it's allocating the broadcast reduced resources for the subcluster needs. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, is the cluster handles redundancy and failures. For very large clusters, failures are inevitable. So the cluster is architected with no single point of failure, and it will detect failures, resume operation, and route around the failures with alternate resources. <coughs> so I've described all the main components. Let's now pull it all together. What does this look like? Well, we started with a wafer scale chip in a CS2 system. We built more systems. We didn't stop there. And now we have racks and racks and rows and rows of CS2 systems. And last year, we announced what we call the Andromeda Wafer Scale Cluster. This is a 16 CS2 system cluster with 13.5 million cores at one exaflop of sparse compute. The very first thing we did when we built that cluster was we trained large models and we open sourced them. Cerebris GPT is the first open source compute optimal large language models up to 13 billion. We put them on Hugging Face and they've already been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. And we also published a paper on it, so if you want to learn more about the models as well as our experience, check it out. Now speaking of our experience, this was actually very insightful because we experienced for the first hand what the reduced complexity of scaling looks like. A small model, let's say a 1 billion parameter model, is actually very simple to write and train on a GPU. For example, Nano GPT, uh, shown here on the left, is an implementation of GPT with only 1,200 lines of code. It runs just fine on a single GPU. But when you try to scale that up to tens, hundreds, or thousands of GPUs, you need to bring in distributed models, distributed frameworks like Megatron, and the complexity balloons to tens of thousands of lines of code. But when we trained Cerebrus GPT, we coded it for a single CS2, and it just scaled up to 16 CS2s on Andromeda without any code change, trained exactly the same way, from one system to 16 systems. But we didn't stop there. Just last month, we announced the CG1 Condor Galaxy 1 wafer scale cluster that we built in partnership with G42. This is a massive 64 node CS2 cluster with a whopping 54 million compute cores and four exaflops of sparse compute. And one of the first things we did was we started train models. And just a few weeks ago, we announced the first public model that we trained on the CG1 wafer scale cluster. This is the BTLM model. It's a 3 billion parameter model that has now set the benchmark in the whole community for 3 billion parameter models. It outperforms all existing models of the same size, and in fact, outperforms many models that are double the size while being trained on less data and using less compute. As a result, when we put it on hugging phase, it's now become the most popular 3 billion parameter model on Hugging Face, with over 1 million downloads in just a few weeks. We are super proud of this model and the work that we've done with the Open Tensor Foundation uh, to, to train it. They're our customer. It was trained for their network called the BitTensor Network. That's why it's called BTLM. We're really proud of this model. 
but we're really looking forward to what we're going to be doing next, so stay tuned. So as we look forward to what's coming up next, and as we wrap up, I just want to highlight one thing. The BTLM model and the Open Tensor Foundation are perfect examples of what Cerebrus and the Wafer Scale Cluster are all about. Our goal is to enable all to train the largest state-of-the-art models, not just the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. And we believe that providing scale-out capabilities to all is critical to pushing to larger models. The wafer scale cluster architecture was designed to be inherently scalable to this end. You can run the largest models on a single device, get data parallel only scaling, and native unstructured sparsity acceleration. With these capabilities, we believe there's no end in sight. Models, they're gonna to continue to grow. Few companies have access to these large models today, but the Cerebrus architecture makes running these large models fast and easy. And by doing this, we're making largest models available to everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Sean. We'll take a few questions. Let's start off with the uh, Slack channel and everybody else line up at the microphone. Great presentation, Sean. Um, this one's from Ali Domiani from Cadence. He asks, what's the primary bottleneck within this Formax network? Is it broadcast reduction on the CPUs, or is it the link speed, or the electrical versus optical phi, et cetera? So uh, the overall Formax interconnect is actually architected so that it's completely balanced with the uh, bandwidth of the CS2. So as designed, there's not technically a, a bottleneck because there's actually fully bandwidth matched. Um, that's why we have all of that um, distributed uh, uh, broadcast reduce capabilities because we get the full bandwidth from the CS2s through the broadcast reduce uh, network into the memory X units. Okay, an audience question, Fred. Start us off. Sure. Hey, Fred. Uh, Fred Weber, I suppose, hot chips. Um, two related questions. Uh, is your training data fed in? To, does either the SwarmX or the MemoryX participate in that, or is that an entirely different system? And also, in typical cases, what is the bandwidth ratio between training data being sent in and weight data being sent in? That's a great question. The training data I did not show in any of my diagrams um, is being sent in over a separate set of uh, data processing servers. Um, they're physically connected into the leaf layer of the, uh, the network topology, but they're using a separate set of servers which are performing operations like the data pipeline and data processing. Um, the amount of data that you're ingesting for the training data is actually highly dependent on the workload. For large language models, the amount of data is actually relatively low, um, like orders of magnitude lower than the data uh, for broadcast and reduce. For computer vision models where you're streaming in you know, images or videos, um, the balance can be actually uh, more like a one-to-one -one balance. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's go to another Slack question. Certainly, um, Sissy Yuan asks, um, when you run different AI applications on this reverse uh, wafer scale engine, do you see different performance challenges between general AI training versus the large language models? And how do the three computing modules, the weight, the activation, the command, have to work on the same data flow at the same time? That's a great question. So uh, when we think of the broad field of different applications, in general, they fall into two kind of extremes. On the one end is the large language models. Uh, on the other end are kind of more traditional computer vision models. And they're kind of polar opposites. One has, high, as I just mentioned in, you know, to Fred's question, uh, the large language models have more compute, less uh, I.O. The computer vision models are kind of the other way around. And so when we designed all of the components of the wafer scale cluster, we're basically looking for the common ground across all of these. Um, and so what I presented is a wafer scale cluster architecture that is actually suited for all of the, the models across the entire spectrum. 
Another question for the audience here. Hi, Ned, it's UC Santa Cruz. So it seems like you have a great advantage of being able to fit the whole model on your wafer chip than having to distribute it. But on the other hand, you're also only like 10x larger than a GPU maybe. So does this only work right now or can you also scale to larger models in the future? And then related to that, is chiplets giving other architectures like GPUs the same advantage that you are having right now? So I think that there's, um, for, for the first part of your question, I think there's kind of two ways to look at why this architecture allows us to run uh, uh, the largest models on a single you know, device. The first is, as you alluded to, right, we have an order of magnitude or more compute just in a single chip. Uh, but the second um, is actually the data flows uh, uh, architecture. Because we can stream in the weights to perform the computation without actually ever even storing them locally, not, not even temporarily, not, not even in a scratch space. Um, we can preserve all of the local memory within the device for non-weights, right? And so if you're training really large models, most of the memory is actually in the weights. And so it's the combination of both of those that kind of give this architectural advantage over a traditional kind of local memory-based uh, device like a GPU. Um, forgot the second question that you have. Chiplets, is, is that... Uh giving GPUs the same way to scale out to larger chips? In, in general, I would say that we are very encouraged by the chiplet kind of direction that the industry is taking in part because it's moving towards this you know, you know, future world that, that we believe in at Cerebrus. And so in general, I, I, we, we are very much a fan of, of chiplets. Um, and in fact, we ourselves are looking at options of using those to potentially even amplify what we're doing. But uh, I think it's, it's great, um, uh, especially some of the more advanced uh, chiplet technologies that are out there. Thanks, great talk. Okay, one final question from the audience and we'll wrap up. Mark Griswold, Broadcom. Uh, so the wafer scale engine distributes compute and the activation memory and power distribution and cooling. Uh, where are the I.O. located for the wafer scale engine? Uh, how much aggregate I.O. do you have into and out of it? And how is it actually getting out of you know some package, quote unquote, and to the rest of the system? So the I/O uh, physically on the wafer is actually on the edge, um, and so you can think of it as an extension to the 2D mesh that's on the uh, on the wafer. Of course, much lower bandwidth. Um, on a single chip in a CS2 today, we have 1.2 terabits of I/O that's coming out in the form of. 100 gigabit Ethernet, which connects into the cluster. Okay, that's it for the questions. Uh, uh, ask anything else additional on the Slack channel. Uh, thanks very much, Sean. Thank you. Uh,